Good morning to everyone. Welcome all to the Tanvas Global Equine Webinar on Acute Emergency Management of Fractures and Wound in Horses. Now I request Dr. S. Sendil Kumar, Associate Professor and Head, to deliver the welcome address. Thank you. Warm good evening to all. Cheerful welcome to the rich ladies and gentlemen virtually joined with us today. It is a great honor and privilege for me to address this wonderful gathering to offer welcome note on the occasion of TANUAS Global Equine Webinar 2021 organized by the Veterinary Clinical Complex, VCRI Varathanadu, Directorate of Clinics, TANUAS. I am glad and excited to welcome our Honorable Vice Chancellor Tanuvas and Chief Patron of this international webinar, also our strong and stable guiding force, a renowned pathologist with international credibility, Dr. C. Balachandran, sir. On behalf of the organizing team, I welcome you, sir. I wholeheartedly welcome respected registrar Tanuvas and Patron of today's event, Dr. P. Tenzing Janaraj, a leader of fresh thoughts, gentle behavior. I welcome you, sir. I would like to welcome Dr. S. Bala Subramanian, Director of Clinics, Convener and Chairman of this webinar, also the real director of this event, who motivates his employees, urges us to have a confidence and most importantly respects all our opinion at all times and every time i welcome you sir it gives me immense pleasure to welcome the speaker dr emilia munsterman associate professor large animal clinical sciences college of veterinary medicine michigan state university usa a woman dedicated herself to the betterment of horses. She is well known for her research on equine electromyo, uh, equine electromyelo intestinography to develop a non invasive means to measure the electrical activity of the equine GA tract. We appreciate the dedicated efforts of Dr. Emilia in equine emergency management and making fractures. A no longer death sentence for the horses. We welcome you, madam. I welcome Dr. L. Nagarajan, Professor in Ed, Department of Clinics, Madras Veterinary College. I welcome with great respect all the university officers and se senior faculty of TANUVAS who has joined this webinar virtually. I welcome all the enthusiastic participants across India and from various parts of the world. I would like to welcome the veterinarians from Indian Army and Border Security Forces who consider mules and horses as an asset in upholding the security of the nation. Your huge support and interest in this webinar Registration gives us great pleasure and energy to the organizing team. Thank you and welcome you all dear participants. I am pleased to announce that this conference is being conducted with the technical support from Alambic Pharmaceuticals and I welcome Dr. Karnanidhi, Vice President of Alambic Pharmaceuticals and all other team members from Alambic. Once again, I welcome you all to this webinar. Thank you for the great opportunity. Thank you, sir, for the brief welcome address. Now I invite Dr. L. Nagarajan, Professor in the Department of Clinics, for the introduction about the webinar. Hello, everyone. Good evening from India. Warm good evening. Um, I'm happy to give a small introduction about this webinar. The director of clinics, 
has always been a forerunner for organizing continuing education programs in the country, and it still strives hard for knowledge dissemination even during this COVID pandemic. It's made the effective use of the digital platforms to organize virtual global seminars and is heavily supported by the Alembic Pharmaceuticals. And we have actually organized about nine global seminars, and this one on acute emergency management of fractures and wounds in horses is the 10th one, and there are more in the pipeline. The horse wearing, apart from reflecting the culture and tradition of our country, they're also used for work and sports in large numbers. Wounds and fractures are common in these animals and, or, and the early appropriate management is essential for early ambulation and to prevent complications. I'm sure that this global webinar uh, by Dr. Munsterman, Associate Professor, Large Animal Clinical Sciences College of Veterinary Medicine, MSU, will immensely benefit those in equine practice across the globe and also the students as well. We are eagerly looking forward to your lecture, Dr. Munster Martin. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for the introduction about the webinar. On behalf of the organizing secretary, may I request the Honorable Vice Chancellor of Tanvas, Dr. Sri Balachandran, to deliver the inaugural address. Very good evening uh, from India and uh, greetings from Tamil Nadu Veterinary and Animal Sciences uh, University. The guest of honor, uh, Dr. Emilia Munsterman, and the organizing team under the leadership of Dr. Balas Pirmaniam, the director of clinics. Dr. L. Nagarajan, Dr. Vijay Kumar, Dr. Sendil Kumar, Dr. Saravanan and uh, others. And my dear uh, participants, I'm happy to be associated with this uh, 10th edition of uh, webinar because this pandemic uh, taught us a different lesson then we are able to uh, reach uh, people through <clears throat> online mode and uh, covering various uh, topics uh, whether it is uh, on the large animal it is uh, cattle or the other side on the ruminants uh, uh, that is uh, sheep and goats and also something on the horses and I have to happy to see that an eminent uh, person was uh, dedicated a work on the horses ailments is going to talk on acute emergency management of fractures and wounds in horses. So it is uh, said that uh, this uh, webinar will throw insight on traumatic wounds uh, as a management of wounds are labor intensive and expensive to manage. So there are several points given on the successful management of equine wounds. It depends on the knowledge of the stages of wound healing, factors that can alter those stages, manipulation of healing stages, and adherence to the principles of wound healing. There are certain challenges that may complicate the wound and uh, certain things like inability to immobilize and or confine equine patients and maintain a clean environment during the critical initial stages of healing. And also I'm going to understand that there are differences in wound healing between horses and ponies. And this has provided uh, valuable information about uh, the intrinsic process of wound healing and the complications that are relatively frequently encoded in the equine. So the surgical lasers can incise or excise tissue, leaving a bloodless surgical site with similar very incisional effects as steel instruments. Tissues swell less and are less sensitive post-operatively due to sealing of 
small vessels and nerve endings. Surgeons must identify the appropriate surgical technique for individual situation. Another issue is on the bacterial infection of traumatic wounds or surgical incisions. This compromises healing and further complicates wound management and the use of appropriate antibiotics is needed for successful management. I hope there will be discussion on conservative methods of wound care treatment of exuberant granulation tissue, use of surgical lasers, grafting, tendon lacerations, and the substances that stimulate repair. The equine practitioners must remain aware of these methods and innovations to better serve their clients and the patients. So in view of the need to update these uh, special care, use of specific type of uh, bandage material, use of extracellular matrix or scaffold. So this uh, global webinar is being organized by uh, this institution so that it will benefit our fellow veterinarians and graduates and veterinary faculty. So as usual, this uh, program is uh, attracting uh, many practitioners uh, and faculty members uh, from India. More than uh, 1,200 people are participating and around 30 people from other uh, countries will also be hearing your uh, lecture. I really appreciate and congratulate the team behind this program and extend my heartiest wishes to the eminent research scientists around the globe for their contribution as resource speakers in this type of webinars. And I thank the all faculty members here and the organizers for giving me this opportunity and wish uh, the program a great success. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your inaugural address. Now I invite Dr. G. Vijay Kumar, Professor at VUPH, to introduction of the speaker. Thank you, Dr. Bhadasan. I take it as a great pleasure to introduce the speaker, Dr. Amelia Munsterman. At the outset, I thank uh, Dr. Amelia Munsterman for readily accepting for the presentation. Dr. Amelia Munsterman, DVM MS, PhD, is an associate professor of large animal surgery and emergency medicine at Michigan State University College of Veterinary Medicine. She earned a DVM in 2001 from the University of Missouri. She completed a master's degree and residency in equine surgery at the Ohio State University. After a fellowship in large animal critical care at Auburn University, leading to ACVECC board certification, she obtained a PhD based on her work, which centered on advanced monitoring tools for equine gastrointestinal diseases. She served as head of large animal critical care service at Auburn University for 10 years, followed by four years as a large animal surgeon at the University of Wisconsin. Dr. Munsterman is the author of over 120 book chapters, peer-reviewed manuscripts, and scientific abstracts. Her research interests are focused on the diagnosis and treatment of intra-abdominal hypertension and gastrointestinal ileus. Now over to Dr. Amelia Munsterman. We are ready to hear your lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you see the screen? The screen? Yeah. Thank you. I would like to thank everyone today for allowing me to come and, and present this lecture to you. And I'm very grateful for this opportunity. Um, so today we're going to be discussing the acute management of equine orthopedic trauma. And I'm going to certify I have no disclosures for this lecture. 
So our objectives today are going to be to, to discuss the goals for stabilization of equine fractures. So how would we do this and how would we try to improve our outcomes by the, the management that we provide at the immediate stages right after the fracture occurs. Um, this will include what we would recommend to owners and people that have the horse so that uh, the horse is restrained and, and kept in a, a manner that's going to best serve um, getting you there on time and providing appropriate treatment. We'll discuss safe restraint techniques, um, key steps in the examination of the horse that would help to improve outcomes. Um, the basics of wound care at this time, when you have a fracture, um, some things um, will be simplified so that the fracture is, is cared for first. Um, we'll describe the coaptation techniques for each stage or each level of fracture. And then key points about transporting the horse and providing prognosis for the owner. So our primary goal of acute fracture stabilization is to protect the limb. And we want to provide support. We want to protect the tissues as well as the bones so that we can provide successful repair down the road. So we're not going to be um, using splints in order to correct the fracture, but we will be protecting those tissues so that you don't have the complications that may decrease our prognosis or even end the horse's life. Um, so this will allow us to then provide our final and successful repair, whether it's a surgical implant, a plate, a screw, whether we're using pin cast or external fixation, or using Thomas Schroeder splint casts in some of our smaller equids as well as um, some of our ruminant species. So the purpose of fracture stabilization or splinting in horses is mainly to prevent additional insult or injury to that limb. We want to preserve the skin because that's the most important part of this entire process. We know that closed fractures are twice as likely to heal than those that are open because open fractures increase significantly the risk that you will have infection of the bone, osteomyelitis, and infection of the tissues and synovial structures surrounding those bones. Um, so we our primary purpose is to make sure that if it is not already open, this fracture stays closed. We'd also like to protect the bone. Um, this prevents additional fragmentation or displacement of that fracture. And it also prevents, the, it reduces the chance of malunion because you won't have those fracture ends rubbing against each other um, before you have the chance to fix the fracture. So the splinting of the fractures will allow for safe evaluation. Um, this is going to make the horse more comfortable. They'll be able to rest the limb, and this will give you time to evaluate the fracture itself, um, what, how the bone is involved, which bone is involved, the configuration of the fracture, and if there are additional injuries, say synovial structures or tendons or ligaments that are involved. It will also allow you to examine the horse and determine if they're systemically stable. Um, many of these horses, if they have been in a race, if they've been exercising prior to the, the injury, um, will be severely hypovolemic and may require either fluid therapy or something to support their, their cardiovascular system um, while you're trying to get these horses to surgery. You can also provide pain management. Um, usually that's a non-steroidal, sometimes an opioid, and then add in antimicrobials as needed in order to prevent any infection from setting up. This is gonna allow you to also provide an accurate assessment of the prognosis for these fractures um, by determining the configuration and whether or not that fracture can be addressed. And the main point of this, this talk is that we want to understand what stabilization or splinting of fractures does not do. It is not going to fix a horse's fracture in 99% of the cases. Um, you're just basically providing support until you can provide the definitive treatment, um, which is usually either surgical or providing uh, external coaptation for these, these fractures. As you can see in this image, this was a horse that had been casted for a long period of time for an open fracture of the cannon bone and the bacteria had actually taken away or eaten away the entire end of the cannon bone um, and the, you can see the, the bones are still quite displaced this is the fetlock um, it's missing the distal end of the condyle and it wasn't appropriately treated after the splinting stage um, so definitely what we want to do is identify what we can and can't do and at this point we're just trying to stabilize the horse enough to allow us to assess these fractures 
So when you identify that this horse or you get a call that this horse has a possible fracture, there's some things you can relay to the owner over the phone to try to improve your outcomes before you even arrive. And the first is to restrain the horse in the area that the, the fracture actually occurred. So if it's safe for the horse to remain where it is, um, it's not in the middle of traffic, it's not in the way of other horses, um, there's no chance of it causing injury to people or itself, um, you'd like to keep them in that area so that the horse does not move or walk more on this fractured limb and cause additional trauma. If the owners are able to address wounds by either gently lavaging the area with some water or applying a bandage um, to stop hemorrhage, that's a great idea. And you can explain to that them over the phone how to do that. And then you can have them try to organize someone to bring a trailer to the area to provide transportation if this horse is to be moved. So when you arrive, you're going to provide a brief physical examination. So identify their hydration status, um, check their heart rate, make sure that they are, are cardiovascularly stable and that you don't have to resuscitate them quickly while you address their, their limb or their, their injuries. You also want to briefly check for additional injuries because often if they're involved in a car accident, um, something more traumatic, there may be additional um, soft tissue injuries, tendon or ligament involvement, joint injuries to other limbs, the thorax, the abdomen that may be also need to be addressed. Um, so those are some brief things you're going to do when you arrive on the farm. You also need to be able to restrain the horse in order to provide to provide these these therapies as well as do your assessment. And this should be basically what is just the minimal amount of restraint that you can provide that is adequate to keep this horse still and in one place. Um, most of the time this can involve either physical or chemical restraint. Um, so physical restraint for well aware of um, a halt or a lead rope, providing a nose twitch, an ear twitch, using a shoulder row as we, we see in these images here. Um, those can be all effective ways to restrain a horse and keep a horse quiet and still while you examine them. However, these horses are often quite painful and may be difficult to keep quiet. Um, so chemical restraint or sedation may be needed. Most commonly, we're thinking of an alpha-2 agonist or xylazine, detomidine, but we may have to add in an opioid or an opioid um, or something along the lines of butorphanol in order to keep these horses a little more quiet. And this will allow us to decrease the dose of both of these types of medications to reduce the risk of side effects. I put in here a table of some of the most common sedation that types that we do use with horses with fractures. And you'll see the top three are going to be our alpha-2 agonists. And selection of which one you would use is going to depend on, number one, how upset the horse is. Um, number two, how cardiovascularly stable they are because they do alter the blood pressure and heart rate. And uh, number three, how long you need the sedation for. And so a lot of times you're going to provide them just short-term sedation while you get the splints in place. Um, so xylazine or detomine can be um, effective. Xylazine is the, the shortest lid of these alpha-2 agonists, anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes. And detomine gives you a little bit longer effect. Um, but romifidine, which is another alpha-2, has probably the longest sedation that we have. So you're looking at one to three hours. Um, the good news is that vermifidine doesn't um, cause as much ataxia as detominine or xylazine. And the horse is easily aroused, mood, his head does not drop. Um, and so those can be some important um, factors, especially if you're planning to put this horse on a trailer. Butorphanol can be added, added in as an opioid agonist antagonist, and this is going to allow you, again, to reduce that dose of the alpha-2 to try to reduce the side effects such as um, ataxia, which can lead them to accidentally use the limb um, and cause additional injury to those structures. I had on there that we could sometimes add in acepromazine to this mix in order to provide some tranquilization. You need to be very careful though because this is, does cause a drop in blood pressure um, due to um, vasodilation. And so it's, it's typically avoided in horses that are hypovolemic. Or we have a recent study 
that shows that it may be effective at lower doses and provide a lot longer duration of sedation up to an hour if it's injected at an acupuncture point. And so GV1 is an acupoint um, beneath the tail, as you can see in this image here, and above the anus, and using a dose that's about 10 times lower than our systemic IV or, or IM dose um, can be effective in order to provide a little bit longer sedation, but um, with less ataxia. So once you have restrained the horse, you provided proper sedation, you performed your initial physical exam, you need to then focus on the affected limb. And so the clinical signs of a fracture um, include the following, and those can be a non-weight-bearing lameness, that can be crepitus that you can palpate under the skin, you can see significant swelling of the limb, as you can see in this sorrel horse here. Um, this horse had a femur fracture. You may palpate the, the fracture fragments beneath the skin or see them if there is a wound involved. And you'll often have abnormal angulation of the limb. Um, so this full on the top left has a, a tibial fracture. You can see how the limb is angled um, an valgus conformation. Some of these clinical signs can be similar to horses that have either a cellulitis or a synovial structure infection. And so we definitely want to do a thorough physical exam in order to identify if this is truly a, suspect, a suspected fracture or if we need to do additional diagnostics for these horses. You'd also like to assess the soft tissue injuries that you see in these, in these um, horses' limbs as well. And so do they have open wounds? Um, this horse in the, in the center here has a pastor and laceration. Um, so definitely you want to, have, to evaluate if the tendons and ligaments are involved. If it's near a joint, um, you want to clean those wounds carefully. You also want to identify if the horse has a neurovascular supply to the limb. And so um, this horse with a radial fracture here, it's a foal um, that has an open radial fracture. Um, you want to identify if the limb is cooled distally to that, um, if you can palpate pulses. Um, sometimes it's very difficult, especially, especially if they're shocky to identify if they have adequate neurovascular supply. And so that can bring in either um, a Doppler unit or ultrasound in order to identify, you can see in this lower image here, if they truly have blood supply to the distal limb. And, and horses that had stretched or strained those vessels, uh, sometimes that can cause thrombosis. And in those cases, unfortunately, that is not a fracture that can be fixed. And so it's, it's critical to identify that early on prior to putting on your splint and um, electing for surgery or, or providing additional therapies um, that this will not be a successful fracture repair. So after providing your initial exam and you have identified that you suspect this horse has a fracture, you're going to then choose how you would co-op this limb or provide the splinting for this fracture to, to allow support. And while Placing a splint on these horses' limbs allows the horse to rest the limb. It will not encourage full weight bearing. And this is important to understand um, because it's not going to typically cause this horse to bear more weight and displace this fracture further. So this isn't going to um, decrease the chances of this fracture or increase the chances of this fracture becoming worse. Um, so the splint itself is going to protect the bone. It's going to protect the soft tissues and the critical skin that's going to, you want to keep intact. And it's also going to allow you to safely obtain radiographs while the splint is on without worrying or risking this horse accidentally stepping on the limb and injuring itself further. So your steps for external coaptation or splinting of the EVA horse's limb involve first addressing your wounds, applying your bandage second, and then placing a splint based on the Splint based on the category of the fracture, where the fracture is on the limb. And we'll discuss those specific categories in the following um, portions of this lecture. So I can identify which, which side of the limb to place the splint on, how far up to place it, and where it should go. So for wound management of acute fractures, often we're just providing first aid only. And the reason is, is that um, we don't have a lot of time if this horse is, is going to possibly fall, um, become ataxic, step on this limb, and cause further injury. We want to get the splint on as quickly as possible. So we're providing the minimum of wound management for these guys initially. So um, definitely assess the wound. Uh, 
identify if you suspect you have synovial involvement, things that you need to then investigate once the source is on the table. Um, but mainly you just want to remove at least the surface contamination. So this can be with um, sterile saline, saline, as you see in this image here. Um, it could be with a hose and just tap water and lavaging out the dirt and debris in order to get this wound as clean as you can in the field. Um, if it's possible to clip and, and clean around the wound, that is great. Um, but sometimes if you have a very severe fracture, it's going to be more critical to get that splint on as quickly as possible. Once that wound is fairly clean, um, you're going to apply a non-adherent primary layer. And I have here that the Telfa bandages that we commonly use here. Um, you'll place that on, apply it with um, some cotton um, gauze to keep it in place. And then you'll be placing your bandage next in order to put your splint on. Once the horse is splinted, it's if you do have an open fracture, it's, it's indicated to provide some broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, typically, we provide either um, some sort of um, cefazolin um, and a aminoglycoside, or you can add in an penicillin and aminoglycoside to provide broad spectrum coverage. If the horse has not had a tetanus prophylaxis in, the, in at least the six months preceding, it's a good idea to booster those, those horses, um, but that can be provided after you have the horses splinted. So once you have addressed the wound, you're going to provide the bandaging that's going to provide the base layer for your splint. And this is going to be adequate enough or thick enough to prevent your soft tissue damage or additional um, movement of those tissues around it. But you don't want it too excessive that would allow the splint to be too far away from the bones beneath and allow the, the splint to shift or, or move around the limb to the, the side of the, the leg that you do not want the splint to be on. And so the bandage itself has three parts, um, a very thick cotton padding layer, and this can either be um, roll cotton, pound cotton, um, or it can be a combine bandage, as you can see in the top picture here. Um, it has a cover over the cotton to keep it from fraying. Um, sometimes you have to ha sort of improvise. Um, some on the farm, you may not have enough bandages on your truck, um, so you may have to either um, find towels from the house, um, use uh, bandages from the, the stable in order to add to your padding to make sure it is thick enough that your splint is appropriately placed. Once the padding is on, um, we'll talk about um, some tips and tricks and how to do that. You want to secure it um, um, tightly with brown gauze. Um, place to go around the limb and sometimes I add in a self-adherent flexible bandage on top of that in order to provide a firm and thick uh, tight bandage and this is we commonly call this vet wrap here in the states. So tips and tricks for applying the bandage. Um, each layer needs to be put on individually. So a pound, two pounds of cotton at a time. Um, you're going to place this overlapping if you're having to extend it up the leg to prevent gaps between your bandage. You don't want an area where there's a, a divot that the splint can press into the, the soft tissues beneath. And the thickness is going to depend on the contour of the limb. So typically for distal limb fractures, where we're just splinting the distal part of the limb, we only need to provide a bandage that's about one times the diameter of the limb. So usually a pound of cotton or one combine bandage will be adequate and thick enough to allow that splint to lay flat against the leg. When we're bandaging farther up the limb, say we have an upper limb fracture, a radius fracture, a tibia fracture, we're going to need more bandage, usually about three times the diameter of the limb, in order to make sure that the bandage is flat enough that your, your straight splint will lie flush against the bandage. Um, the key point is that anywhere that there's a gap between the splint and the bandage, the splint is not providing support for the bones beneath. So we want to add padding um, anywhere we have a gap and we place the splint up against the limb in order to make sure that bandage is a nice tube shape. Once your bandage is in place, you're going to then apply your splint. And this is typically some sort of rigid material. It could be wooden boards from the, the farm, um, some plastic fence posts, um, but most commonly we're going to use some PVC or polyvinyl chloride pipe. And this is plumbing pipe. Um, you can see in the lower left hand here, um, comes in these tubes and we'll go ahead and cut or rip that down into a, a splint that's the appropriate size and width in order to get it against the limb. Um, Usually you can do this with um, some type of um, um, electric saw, 
Um, even your, your cast cutters can cut this material, so that's something you can use in order to get it the right shape. Um, we keep a bunch of these splints at the hospital that are their appropriate size and shape for the average size horse. Um, so we have those ready, readily made for an emergency situation. Once you've made your splint or you've decided on the material you're going to use for your splint, um, you will pad the ends of the splint to prevent any pressure sores. So if the splint slips off the bandage and comes in contact with skin or soft tissues, you don't have it directly poking into those tissues. Um, normally I'll just apply some cotton over the ends of the splint and secure that with some sort of non-elastic tape. Um, so once you place the splint against the limb, um, Different types of tape you can use can be white medical tape, um, duct tape or cloth back tape is very effective for placing these things on. Um, but in more severe fractures that are say comminuted um, and you're worried about some the limb still shifting with a splint against the leg, you can apply just casting tape over the splint in order to keep it in place. The rule of thumb for a splint, um, you want to make sure that the splint never ends in the middle of a long bone, say a cannon bone, a radius, a tibia, um, because this will form a stress riser and increase the risk it could further fracture the limb. There are commercial um, uh, splints available on the market, and one of those is the Kimsey Leg Saver. It's commonly used here on the tracks. Um, because it's typically the, the perfect size for the average thoroughbred horse. And so it has this foot plate on the bottom, um, which fits on, has a solid plate on the bottom that goes over the sole. And then these metal pieces come up the sides of the hoof wall. And then I'll have a splint that extends or is tied in. Um, these are typically made of aluminum that comes up the front of the limb, which is then secured to the leg with these Velcro straps. And while the splint is very effective, it's easy to use, um, it does have some drawbacks to have to keep and consider when you're placing these on the, on the leg of the horse. Um, number one is that these, these um, Velcro straps do have gaps between each of them. And so if you have a highly comminuted fracture, it may be possible that the fracture will still be unstable if the fracture lies between those two straps. And so sometimes I'll actually add to these splints and place um, duct tape or white tape over the top of these in order to fill in those gaps between the straps of the splint. The other thing you want to consider is where you would like these splints to be placed for optimum fracture support. And while this first um, splint here on the left hand side is ideal for distal limb fractures, we have a splint that is going to be applied to the front of the limb. If you're uh, splinting a fracture that's higher up, you would actually want your splints to be on there, either on the caudal or lateral side. And so this more extensive splint here that goes up farther while it does go farther up the leg and could get closer to um, the, the fracture that you're trying to splint is actually going to be on the wrong side of the limb. So I typically don't use um, this longer uh, splint that's, that's available for that reason. And the other reason I don't use this other splint here on the right hand side, which is a hind limb splint, is it's going to be placing the limb, flat, um, the hoof flat on the ground. And if a horse is actually has a fracture, most typically the hind limb is going to be flexed. And with the reciprocal apparatus, that actually will keep the fetlock in flexion. And it's going to be very difficult to get that splint on. So I will use the forelimb splint, which is the, the splint labeled A here, for both forelimb and hind limb distal limb fractures. And so just consider if you do have a commercial splint, is it going to appropriately um, provide support for the fracture that you're trying to address? So we'll talk now a little bit about the selection and placement of the splints on the leg. And this is going to be based on the, the standard levels of stabilization. So we divide the leg of the horse into four levels and each level has a different type of splint and placement of the splint in order to adequately supply support for those fractures that are in that area. Um, so we'll talk about each in turn and how each level is slightly different. Um, between levels and as well between the front and hind limbs. So for level one fractures, these are going to involve fractures that occur in the distal forelimb or hind limb. So the distal one third of the cannon bone or the first or second phalanx. Um, this can be, these splints also can be used for luxations, um, but typically they're used for fracture um, stabilization. And so the goal of the level one splint 
is to align the dorsal cortices of the bones into one long structure. And this is going to allow weight bearing to go straight down the dorsal cortices and hopefully prevent um, angulation of the limb or flexion at the joint or at the region of the fracture itself. So typical level one fractures that we see that um, this splint is applied on um, could be our P1 fractures. You can see this mid-sagittal fracture here on the left-hand side. Um, it could be our comminuted P2 fractures that we often see in our, our Western uh, performance horses. Um, but one type of fracture we won't need to splint, even though it is in the distal limb, is our coffin bone fractures here. And the reason is, is that these fractures are supported by the hip wall and already have a, a natural natural splint on them. So you won't see displacement typically of these coffin bone fractures. And so a splint will not be needed for those. Um, one thing to think about, and we'll talk about this as we go through the different fracture levels, is that we need to be able to identify or classify the fracture in order to discuss it with our colleagues, provide proper surgical planning or get a second opinion over the phone. And so some of these um, the steps in terms of classifying these fractures involve these um, um, descriptions, which can include whether it's complete or incomplete. An incomplete fracture would be a green stick fracture, which, which we sometimes see in our younger, in younger horses, but not very commonly. Um, it could be that we need to describe whether it's opened or closed. Um, does our wound communicate with our fracture? We need to understand the configuration of the fracture. Is it a spiral fracture, a transverse fracture? Um, those are, you need to be able to describe the direction the fracture is running. Is it simple or comminuted, which is pretty um, easy to understand? And whether or not it involves a joint or articular structure. Once you've identified these classification scheme, um, you also want to identify what bone is involved and which part of the bone. So is it diaphyseal or metaphyseal? And what direction, if the fracture is displaced, is the bone that is distal to the fracture moved? And that's going to allow you to discuss these, these fractures over the phone. So for application of a level one splint, um, the first part of this is once you've addressed your wound is to apply that light rubber Jones bandage. Um, so one pound of ro roll cotton or one combine um, should be enough padding to place your splint. You'll apply that tightly with your brown gauze and vet wrap and then place your splint against the limb. Um, the splint should be applied again with that non-elastic tape so that it doesn't shift. And it's gonna be applied to the dorsal surface of both the forelimb or hind limb. But sometimes it makes it really difficult to get it on the hind limb because of that reciprocal apparatus. It's going to, the horse is going to keep flexing that fetlock and it's going to be difficult to pull um, the distal, the phalanx forward in order to get those bones aligned. Um, so sometimes we have to make do and apply the splint on the caudal surface of the hind limb. And the splint will usually be attached to the, the heel bulbs and then run up the back of the leg. And I have some pictures in the next slides. Um, but you'd want to try to get that, that fetlock as stable as possible against that splint so it doesn't bend um, as the horse moves. The key points for a level one splint is that we definitely need to pad the splint at the top where it possibly could contact the leg if it extends past your bandage. Um, but we don't need to pad it distally because it's going to be against the hoof wall. And so it, the, the hoof wall is well protected and doesn't need any padding at that, at that point. We want to align the dorsal cortices. Um, so we want to get those all in one, one line. So I have some tips and tricks on how to do that. And this is the fracture that we could use that Kimsey leg saver splint. Um, but remember that with comminuted fractures, you may have to provide additional support by applying more tape over the top of that splint and those Velcro straps. So here are some examples of level one splints. We have our bandage here on the left on blue that extends from the carpus all the way down past the coronary band. So we want to protect that coronary band from any damage. Um, here's our Kimsey in place um, for the, we can see a light Robert Jones bandage and then our Velcro straps going around to hold it against the leg as it goes up the front of the leg and then around the, the heel bulbs here. And all these straps are attached to the splint. And then here are our forelimb and hindlimb splints with a PVC splint attached. So we have our thick padding at the top, our PVC splint going down the front of the leg all the way to the ground and applied with white tape over the top of that bandage all the way up to the top. Again, in the hindlimb, it may be difficult to get that splint to conform in a straight line down the front of the leg. 
um, because that horse will want to flex that limb because it's painful. So we're just going to apply the splint to the back. The hoof wall is, or the sole of the foot is, is sort of angled up at about a 45 degree angle. And then we apply enough tape to keep that foot lock stable and in that position against the splint along the back of the leg. So some tips and tricks on how to apply level one splints. And what can sometimes be helpful is to have um, a colleague hold the leg up by the radius. And so here you can see this, this person is holding the limb over the top of his leg and allowing this leg from the carpus down to hang. And what this does is it aligns all those dorsal cortices in one line and makes it easier to place that splint along the dorsal surface and without the horse flexing or, or extending the leg if he accidentally steps on it um, while he's trying to stabilize himself. And this it makes the horse comfortable if you hold the limb up and support him. And then you can apply the tape all the way from the door top to the bottom of the splint to incorporate the foot. Again, the Kinsey splint, as I said before, may require additional tape over the top of those straps to keep it in place. For a level two fracture, so this is moving up the limb, um, we divide those into forelimb and hind limb splints simply because there are some differences between those two in terms of the, the bone involved, how high up the limb the splint will go, and where we will be placing these splints. So for forelimb fractures, a level two fracture, we're thinking about fractures that involve the, the mid to proximal metacarpus, the carpal bones themselves, or the distal radius. And the goals here are to align those bones and prevent abduction of the limb. And you can think about all the muscle that's along the caudal surface of the limb, as well as the lateral surface is going to abduct the distal limb and displace that fracture if the splint is not applied. The splint of a, for a level two extends from the ground to the level of the elbow, and we will have two splints now. One will be caudal and one will be lateral to the limb. So here are some examples of level two fractures um, that will the splint will be applied for. So here we have an open fracture of the distal to mid radius. It's a transverse um, configuration. Um, it's complete. It's non-comminuted. Um, so this is a common fracture that we would use a splint all the way up to the level four. Um, this is uh, a, a comminuted carpal fracture. Um, we can see that the proximal row of carpal bones has been completely crushed and the radius is moving down the limb. So we want to try to keep this limb from, from crushing further with our splint. And here we have a mid diaphyseal um, cannon bone fracture, um, probably also involves the splint bones. You can see this butterfly fragment um, that has occurred and the horse is starting to get a valgus conformation as the limb is abducted by the, the structures on the lateral surface. So we want to apply the splint to prevent that from, from moving further. So when applying a level two splint, um, in this case, we're going to apply a thicker Robert Jones bandage. So we're using anywhere from six to 10 pounds of roll cotton, um, six to nine combines if you're using those commercial bandages. And each layer is going to be applied separately with brown gauze and our vet wrap to try to get a nice tight, tight bandage that will not shift or, or move around the limb. We'll then apply the two splints, one caudal, one lateral, going all the way up from the floor to the to the elbow um, with our non-elastic tape and we will have to pad that splint at the top. Again, we don't need to splint or pad it typically at the bottom because it will be incorporated with the hoof. And the key points is that we want to apply the bandage layers separately. Again, we want to put the caudal splint on first because it's often easiest to get the leg into a tube shape um, and it's nice smooth bandage um, for a caudal splint. Um, but we will have to check when we place our lateral splint that there's no gaps between the splint and the bandage. So we may have to actually apply a, a little bit more bandage material if it has if it isn't flush against that um, splint when we place that lateral splint. Um, so it's not um, a faux pas if you have to apply more bandage material after you've placed your caudal splint. And then make in this case, the foot is going to be flat on the ground. Um, so you won't have it flexed for this type of fracture, fracture splinting. So tips and tricks for applying a level two bandage or to level two splint. Um, the bandage we applied in single layers, you can see he's already applied the distal bandage here and placed his brown gauze over the top and now they're overlapping and applying a bandage 
um, proximal to that in first bandage. Um, this may require a couple layers of this cotton and combine bandage, um, but each one needs to be applied separately with our brown gauze and vet wrap. The splint will then be placed from the elbow down to the floor. Again, you'll need to pad the top of the splint. And just for demonstration purposes, I have just shown this, this splint attached by um, some white tape in three, three sections. You will need to apply white tape or duct tape from the top to the bottom, at least three to five layers in order to get enough, enough a tight um, uh, connection between the splint and the bandage and make sure that the splint doesn't shift. Once your caudal splint is on, again, the foot is flat on the floor, you'll apply your lateral splint up to the level of the elbow, and again, apply more white tape, three to five layers, in order to keep that splint against the leg. Sometimes this makes it difficult for the horse to walk once you have the splint in place. You can see here in this video, the horse is having to try to swing the leg out and around or abduct it in order to get the limb to advance. And one thing you can do to improve or make it easier for this horse to walk would be to place a lead rope around the fetlock and then simply just pull the leg out to the side as the horse tries to advance it. And so you can help him swing that leg around and get him to figure out how to move the, that leg and advance that leg um, once that leg is splinted because it is going to be longer than the other limb at this point. So for level two fractures on the hind limb, there are some subtle differences that we'll talk about. And so in hind limb fractures, um, these are only going to evolve the mid to proximal metatarsis. Um, because we're not able to um, basically splint the joint above and below anything higher. Um, so the goals are um, to again, align the bones and prevent abduction of the limb. So we're going to be again, placing the splints caudal and lateral because that's where our musculature and our, our tendons are on the limb. And the splint here will be extending from the ground to the tip of the calcaneus. Um, again, lateral and caudal to the limb. So examples of a level two fracture uh, would be again, your proximal metatarsis and often including the splint bones. So in this image, we have a complete closed um, transverse fracture of the mid diaphysis of this uh, metatarsis. It's mildly accommodated, has a butterfly fragment caudal medial, and it has minimal displacement. So here you can actually see um, this horse is wearing a splint. I mean, you can see the splint is these, uh, the radiolucent uh, structures here on the lateral side and the, or the caudal side and the lateral side. And that's what it's going to look like when you radiograph these legs. So to apply a level two splint to the hind limb, we're again going to apply a very thick Robert Jones bandage. So six to 10 pounds of cotton on top of the leg applied in separate layers. So a pound at a time applied with our gauze and vet wrap. And then we're going to place our two splints, caudal and lateral. Again, the caudal, caudal one's gonna be easier to apply. So usually we'll apply that one first, but, we're gonna, but we are gonna apply those separately with non-elastic tape. And again, we want to apply, apply the bandage layer separately, apply the caudal splint first, and ensure there's no gaps between the bandage and the splint. So here's an example of a level two splint on a hind limb. We have our bandage extending up past our splinting material. Um, we placed our caudal splint on here and applied it with um, some white tape for demonstration. But again, you're going to apply at least three to five layers of tape for all the way from the top to the, the bottom of the splints in order to keep it in place. And then place your lateral splint, again, repeating with three to five layers of tape in order to keep that in place. So this is what it's going to look like on the hind limb. Again, these horses may need assistance to walk. Um, so again, you can apply that rope to the fetlock or the pastern area and, and simply pull the limb abducted as they try to advance the limb and move forward. Level three fractures, again, are going to be divided between forelimb and hind limb because they are slightly different in how we would, do, would apply splints. Uh, so for forelimb fractures, this is going to be involving fractures to the mid to proximal radius. Um, again, our go goals are to align the bones and prevent abduction. Um, this only will involve though, um, we will apply two splints again. Um, one will be to the level of the elbow caudally, but our lateral splint will now extend to the level of the wither. So we're gonna go up much higher with our lateral splint uh, 
in order to try to stabilize the joint above this fracture. So here's an example of a level three fracture. Um, we have a fracture of the proximal radius and distal ulna. It's complete, it's open. You can see these are staples here that were used to temporarily close the wound prior to fracture fixation. You can see our splinting material here on the side of the limb coming down each side um, that we've shot through. This is PVC splinting pipe, so it is radio loosened if you hit it straight on. Um, it is a bleak or a spiral configuration with some mild comminution. There's a tiny fragment here, and it is mid-diaphyseal. So typical fracture, we're going to splint with a level three splint. So to apply the splint, again, we're going to use a very thick Robert Jones bandage, so six to 10 pounds of cotton applied in each layer with brown gauze and vet wrap. Our two splints, one caudal, one lateral. Again, at this time, we're going to extend the lateral splint up to the level of the withers. And again, we want to apply our bandage layer separately, apply the caudal splint first, and ensure we have no gaps between the splint and the bandage. So here are some examples of a level three splint on horses that we have um, provided this co-optation. Uh, again, we're applying the bandage in separate layers. Um, so they've already placed two layers of bandage material and they're applying now a, a third layer distally in order to overlap and get this bandage thick enough. It takes some time to get these bandages on. Uh, we're going to place the caudal splint first up to the level of the elbow. You can see this horse in the, in the picture at the bottom of the screen. And some people discuss um, putting a figure eight around the bandage in order to secure it. You can see in this, this little cold at the top um, that we've applied some white tape around the horse in order to keep the splint um, from moving away from the shoulder and um, keeping that splint in place. Uh, the problem with this figure eight configuration um, where we've placed bandage material around the chest is that it's going to prevent that splint from swinging forward and backwards as the horse advances and walks with the limb. And so most commonly what I will do is if I think the split needs that figure eight around the top, I will take them, put them into the trailer or wherever they're going to need to be standing for a period of time and then place it on in the trailer there because they won't need to be walking at that point. So this um, advantage will need to be cut off from the chest to allow them to walk uh, once you get them where they need to be going and you need to get them off the trailer. Um, most of the time, however, um, this splint just with applying this amount of tape to the distal limb will be tight enough and, and um, firm enough against the, the tissues of the shoulder that you won't need this figure eight configuration. So typically you make it just like this horse here in, in the bottom picture. Um, with just the, the tape on the distal portion of the limb. For level three, three fractures of the hind limb, it's going to be some subtle differences between that and the forelimb. And these are going to involve fractures of the hock, um, the tibia, and the stifle joint. Again, our goals are going to, be, going to be to align the bones and prevent abduction of the limb. Um, in this case, the splint again is going to extend from the ground um, to the dorsum, so usually we're going up to the level of the tubercoxae, um, but we're only going to be using a splint on the lateral surface. And the reason is, is that we're not able to configure a splint that will fit against the caudal aspect of the limb up to the level of the stifle um, with that horse uh, moving and bending that leg because of the reciprocal apparatus. Again, that horse is going to bend the entire limb when it tries to flex it in, it's going to actually cause that splint on the on the caudal side to displace. Um, so in this case, we only need one splint on the lateral surface. So here's some examples of level three fractures. So here we have a fracture of the proximal tibia. This was actually a type four Salter Harris fracture that went basically through the, the physes and extended up into the joint. Um, here on the bottom left, we have an open mid-diaphyseal comminated tibial fracture. Um, this is typically what tibial fractures look like. We have a huge amount of comminution, a lot of displacement, and this giant hematoma you can see here on the side on the Gaskin. And we also can splint at level three fractures of the talus. So here we have a comminated open fracture of the talus. Um, we can see the skyline view here. So to apply a level three splint on the hind limb, we're going to again apply a very thick Robert Jones bandage up to the level of the stifle, pretty much as far up as you can get it. 
And so you're gonna need at least six to 10 pounds of cotton or six to nine combines. Again, each one is applied separately and you're gonna to try to place it as far up as you possibly can get it. The splint will then be placed against the lateral side of the limb. Because of that reciprocal apparatus, we can't place one caudally. We'll put that on with non-elastic tape and we'll pad the top of the bandage. And again, each layer needs to be placed separately of the bandage. Um, we can apply a, the, the splint laterally. Usually you're going to um, sort of fit it against the limb from the heel, and then I angle it up so it lies directly over the um, hip joint in order to get it to fit the limb the best. Um, but again, you don't want any gaps between the bandage and the splint, so we may have to apply additional padding based on how the splint looks once you pull it up to the leg. So here are some examples of level three hind limb splints. Um, so again, our lateral splint only, we have this bandage that extends up to the level of the stifle. Again, I just have some white tape on here holding the splint against the leg so you can actually see the bandage and the splint. Um, this, this is a board, a two by four I keep in the, in the hospital just in case um, we have a fracture that comes in that needs to be stabilized. Um, you can see here, this is a cranial shot. Um, the horse is flat on the floor, um, the sole of the foot. It's basically sitting back by the heel bulbs and extending up and lying directly over the hip joint proximally. If you don't have a board, you have time to make these ahead of time. I've actually made some splints out of loops. Um, this electrical conduit um, pipe material. You'll need a pipe bender in order to get it into this sort of hairpin shape. And this will allow you to actually fit it to the, the angulation of the limb a little bit better and um, provide a little bit better support on the lateral side. But again, it needs to extend up and sort of circle around the hip joint before it comes back down the back side of the leg. Um, so this is an alternative splint that you can make and have pre-made in your clinic in order to better fit the contour for a, tight, a level three hind limb fracture. Moving on to level four splints, um, these are going to be a little bit more difficult to co-opt. Um, the number one problem is that um, these fractures are going to occur in, in bones of the proximal limb where it's, you're unable to stabilize the joint above and below the fracture. Um, so for four limb, this is going to be fractures of the olecranon, the humerus, the scapula, and for hind limb, it's going to be fractures of the stifle, femur, and pelvis. So our goals are to basically sort of lock the forelimb and extension to provide some comfort to the horse through the, the forelimb stay apparatus, um, but we aren't actually splinting the fracture itself. We aren't able to put a board against this in order to stabilize it. Um, so we'll discuss on how we would actually just lock that leg and extension. Um, however, hind limb fractures, there's no real way with the reciprocal apparatus to co op the limb, so we can't splint fractures. Of level four fractures of the hind limb. So examples of level four fractures that we would splint in the forelimb uh, would be this oblique, um, simple, closed, mid diaphyseal humeral fracture we can see here, um, or this level or type four Salter Harris fracture of the distal humeral condyle here. Um, so this is the elbow joint. Um, those are typical fractures that we would splint with a level four splint. So to apply these, they're going to be very similar to our level two splints um, that we placed previously. So a very um, large Robert Jones bandage, um, six to 10 pounds of cotton, our brown gauze and vet wrap applying each layer separately, extending it up as far proximal as we possibly can. Um, in this case, though, we only technically need one splint. Um, so caudal to the elbow um, will, uh, from the elbow all the way to the ground, will provide enough support to keep that leg in extension. Because we aren't actually splinting the fracture, we don't need the additional support of the lateral splint. Um, you can place it. It's not going to make things uh, worse, um, but it's not needed. And if you don't have that splint, it's not technically needed for this type of splinting. The bandage, again, needs to be applied in separate layers. And what this is doing is basically simulating the triceps apparatus to allow the horse to lock the limb, sort of rest the limb and keep it comfortable. Um, but it's, again, not going to splint the bones that are actually broken approximately. 
Another use of a level four splint is for radial nerve paralysis. And so you can see on this left-hand side, the typical appearance of a horse with radial nerve paralysis. He has this dropped elbow. Um, he's flexed the carpus and the fetlock. And if at, this horse is gonna be very, it's gonna be very difficult for him to use a slum. He's gonna to try to step on it repeatedly and it's going to collapse on him. Um, so if we can splint this, we can make him a lot more comfortable while either the radial nerve paralysis resolves um, or we can figure out um, how we need to address that paralysis further. And so here we have a horse that actually developed radial nerve paralysis after colic surgery, and I've applied a bandage up to the proximal part of the leg. Um, this horse actually does have a splint on the lateral surface, but he doesn't need this technically. And there's one running up the caudal aspect to the elbow applied with some duct tape, and that's going to keep his leg um, locked in extension and make him much more comfortable while this, this paralysis resolves. So again, just to emphasize, uh, in level four fractures in the hind limb, we are not going to be able to splint the fractures because we can't stabilize the joint above and below. And so this is a horse with a, a femur fracture. You can see the significant amount of swelling we have in this leg. He has the leg flexed because he's non-weight bearing. And in the caudal view, you can see how wide this limb has actually become. Um, that is all hematoma. And that swelling helps to sort of splint the fracture on its own and keep it fairly stable just from the amount of swelling and hemorrhage that you have around this fracture. But again, level four hind limb fractures will not require a splint. So once you've co-opted the limb, you've placed your splint, you need to identify what this fracture actually looks like. So we will perform our radiographs after the splint is in place. Um, so the key here is that you want to use um, non-radio opaque, uh, you want to use radio lucid materials so this fracture, the splint does not obscure your view of the fracture. Um, you may need to increase your power or your MAS and your KVP of your x-ray in order to get it to penetrate all of that splinting material and that bandage, um, but you should be able to see this, this fracture if you're radiographing through either a wooden splint or that PVC splint that we talked about. Once you've um, identified what the fracture looks like and describe the, you can describe the fracture configuration with your colleagues and determine how you would plan to actually address this fracture and um, resolve the, the problem with surgery. Um, this will also allow you to then discuss with the owners um, different options for treatment um, or whether or not this is a fracture that may require euthanasia. Once the splint is, is in place, um, you want to bring the trailer to the horse so it doesn't have to walk very far with these splints. Um, you don't want them walking a lot on them because they still can shift and cause the bandage material to compress. And when it does, it's going to make the splint loose and it's, you're going to lose the effect of the splint itself on that fracture. Um, so bring the trailer to your horse. If you have a ramp in the back, that's going to make it a lot easier for these horses to get on to the trailer with the splint in place. And then if you're able to configure the trailer in different ways, say you have dividers that you can move, um, you'd like to load the horse with the limb um, that is fractured on the back side. Um, and the reason is, so technically you would load a horse forward, facing the forward part of the trailer for hind limb fractures, and you would face the horse backwards for fore limb fractures. And the reason is it's more likely that the driver will have to slam on his brakes and stop suddenly um, rather than accelerate quickly. And when he does, you want to have two good legs in the front for this horse to um, prop himself up and stop himself from moving. So you want the fracture in the back if possible. However, some trailers it is impossible to move the dividers, and so in those cases we just load the horse the direction that the dividers allow us to and make sure the dividers are tied up against the horse so the horse is not ha has something to, to rest against while he's being moved. What you don't want to do is place a horse in a trailer like this um, with no dividers, loose in a large stock trailer where he has no way to support himself and sort of um, adjust himself if there's sudden stops or turns. Um, so make sure the dividers are tight against them. You want to loosely tie their head in case he does fall down so he doesn't strangle himself. 
Um, if it's a foal, you can have the handler ride in the trailer with him, keep the, horse, the foal separate from the mare in a separate stall. Um, and they can actually, you can actually put the foal on the ground to keep him down during the trailer ride. Um, this may require a little bit of sedation to do, um, but it'll be better than him trying to move around the trailer on his own. And then horses that are being trailered with the fractures can be provided hay in a hay net. Um, when they're eating, it makes them more comfortable. It relieves stress. Um, so this is something you can do to make this horse a little more happy. So again, never transport a horse loose in a trailer with a fractured limb. So prognosis for fractures is going to depend on a number of things. And so this is why we want to address the limb, address the wounds, um, and then identify the fracture configuration. So we know that our open fractures are two times more likely to not heal. Um, so this it's important to make sure that we keep that skin intact if it's not open already. Um, the fracture configuration, the, if it's comminuted, may make it more difficult for you to apply either your external coaptation or your, your metal implants. And so this may make it more difficult to actually fix this fracture. And then again, the bone that, the, that is broken as well as age and size of the horse um, may affect what um, fracture um, fixation you can use down the road. Um, so horses that are over 300 kilograms um, have a worse prognosis just simply due to the fact that we don't have implants that are often strong enough to counter the forces um, that are being placed on those fractures. Again, bones that are in the distal limb will have a better chance of being um, fixed by either plates, screws, or external coaptation or external fixators. Um, and anything above the corpus and tarsus has a guarded to grave prognosis in our larger horses. So again, if you have any questions as you're, you're addressing a horse with a fracture about um, whether or not this fracture can be fixed, um, whether or not the owners are going to be able to move forward in order to get this, this fracture addressed, you still wanna go ahead and splint the fracture. And this is going to give you time to, number one, radiograph the limb safely. It's going to prevent additional injury to this limb before you get the fracture addressed. Um, and it's going to allow you time to contact others for a second opinion so that you can figure out if you can fix this fracture and what the odds or the prognosis for this horse are after the fracture is addressed. Um, so you can always euthanize the horse, um, but if you haven't placed this splint, it may significantly reduce the chances that you'll be able to fix the fracture. So to summarize our talk today, um, emergency stabilization, stabilization of equine fractures is basically a stepwise process. We want to manage our wounds, we want to apply, apply an appropriate bandage, and then place the splint on the correct side of the leg and the correct number of splints. Um, we want to, again, though, remember to stabilize our whole, whole horse. So after we've applied these splints, um, treat any hypovolemia, provide your antibiotics if needed, and manage pain appropriately with some sort of non steroidal possibly an opioid, and sedation if needed. Um, so this should easily get you guys um, prepared to address fractures if you see them in the field and figure out the next step prior to deciding on whether or not what type of um, internal fixation you would then apply. So I'd be glad to answer any questions. If, you, if you'd like to email me, here is my email. Um, but again, I thank you and the university for allowing me to present this talk today. And I've greatly enjoyed um, doing this. And I thank again, everyone for allowing me to um, come and, and visit with you guys. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very thank much, you very Amelia and Mr. Shaman. It was a quite informative uh, lecture. Um, the many questions we'll be posting through the email. Of course, we have selected some questions. We'll, uh, uh, can you uh, minimize the presentation so that uh, we already minimized? Okay. Yes. So now uh, a list of questions are there that will be posted to you. You can answer one by one. Thank you. Um, good morning, ma'am. Uh, this is the moderator for this uh, um, seminar, the webinar. There are some quite a questions from uh, people around uh, the world. And uh, there's a person, uh, the doctor called Nikita.
and uh, she has asked that uh, why this uh, wound healing is getting delayed in uh, diabetic patients. In what type of patients? In diabetic patients, the persons who are having high glucose levels. Oh, um, that's sort of out of my area of expertise simply because um, horses don't typically get diabetes. Um, they do get metabolic syndrome and, and the reason there that they have delayed wound healing is because um, they have high systemic corticosteroid levels and those steroids will re delay wound healing. Um, that's the reason for that in horses. Oh, I can't hear you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. And um, a person called Dr. Jitul Bahman from Guwahati in China and uh, India has uh, posted a question asking that, is it essential to remove the chip fractures located at the dorsal radial carpal bone in an amateur horses? Oh, it depends on if it's causing clinical disease. So I would definitely block the joint to see if it's causing an issue. Um, if the horse is lame or if the block improves that horse, that may be a fracture fragment that needs to be removed. Yep. And um, myself, I am uh, an assistant professor here in the Department of Surgery, Madras Veterinary College. And my work was on wounds and skin flap reconstructions. And uh, I have a question, uh, basically. And um, we use a lot of uh, lavaging solutions for the wound. Mm -hmm. uh, what lavaging solution do you think it's ideal? Ideally, you would like to use a balanced electrolyte solution. Um, so um, your LRS would be probably ideal. You could use 0.9 sodium chloride. Um, you'd like to avoid water um, simply because that can sometimes cause edema and waterlog the tissues if it's an open wound. Um, sometimes I do recommend that in the field because there's so much dirt, you don't have enough um, sterile saline on your truck to lavage that wound out. But definitely, if you have that, that would be ideal. <laughs> okay, okay. And uh, regarding the bandages, we find a lot of uh, difficulty in bandaging the uh, wounds, which are basically above the, uh, the elbow joint and the, uh, the hog joints. And then they rarely stay on that position, even if you put a bandage and they go for a sort of a biological tourniquet. So they pick it tight. So how do you actually bandage or recommend uh, to make the bandage stay in that position? Um, one thing that helps um, if it's say on the proximal, say the radius or right above the hawk, I always put a bandage distally, even though there's nothing wrong with the distal limb, um, so that it doesn't slide down the leg. And by tying it into a full limb bandage, that sometimes prevents it from slipping. Um, the other way I do it, say if it's on a chest or somewhere that you can't bandage at all, um, I'll do what, what's called a tie-over bandage. I'm sure you've heard of a tie-over. Yeah. Um, put the little loops of suture around and then um, use like a shoe uh, string. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and that works really well for those. Okay, ma'am. You want to ask a question? Okay, ma'am, I think... Uh, among the 350 questions, there are lots of questions, <laughs> and uh, some questions are more of uh, uh, subject oriented and some are basics. So uh, I think I have uh, listed some of the questions which needs a lot of uh, uh, remarks from your side. So that, I think that's the end of the question section here, right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Now I invite Dr. M. Saranan, Ashton Professor, to propose the oath of thanks. Thank you, ma'am. Very, very nice presentation. Uh, it's a very good evening to all. It's great honor and my privilege to present a oath of thanks for each and everyone for the successful conduct of TANWAS Global Equine Webinar 2021 on acute emergency management of fracture and wounds in horses, which are organized by Director of Clinics, Tanwas. On behalf of, behalf of organizing committee, I express my profound gratitude of, to our Honorable Vice Chancellor Tanwas, Dr. C. Balachandran, sir, uh, permitting to organize this webinar and even his uh, busy schedule, he delivered a presiden presidential address. Thank you, sir.
I am sincerely thank to our uh, respected register, Tanuas, Dr. P. Tenzing uh, Nyanaraj sir for uh, accorded permission to conduct this webinar. Thank you, sir. I wholeheartedly express my sincere thanks to our beloved Director of Clinics, Tanuas, Dr. S. Balasubaranam, sir, who is the backbone of this uh, webinar and for his con constant support and uh, encouragement for the success of this webinar. Thank you, sir. And uh, on behalf of Organizing Committee, we thank our uh, international guest speaker, uh, ma'am, Dr. Emilia, uh, Emilia, uh, Michigan State University for providing informative lecture and discussion on uh, fracture and wound management in the horses. Thank you, ma'am. We thank all the deans of constituent colleges and faculties who are supported to the, uh, conduct this webinar successfully. We also thank Dean, uh, dean of uh, Madras Veterinary College, uh, Chennai, for providing conference hall for conducting this webinar. Thank you, sir. I thank Dr. L. Nagarajan, sir, Professor and Head, Department of Clinics, uh, MVC Chennai for his support and his help to conduct this webinar successfully. Thank you, sir. I express my sincere thank to sincere thanks and gratitude to Dr. G. Vijay Kumar, sir, Professor and Head, uh, VUPH Madhavaram for his moral support to conduct this webinar successfully in a grand manner. And thank you, sir. And uh, we extend our uh, sincere thanks to Professor and Head Department of uh, and Animal Husbandry, Statistics and Computer Application and the Department of Extension Education for supporting uh, deputing staffs and faculties for supporting uh, for the providing IT support and as well as other activities. We wholeheartedly thanks technology partner Alambic Pharmaceuticals, Dr. Karnanadi, Vice President Alambic Pharma and Dr. Sandhya Shinde, AGM Marketing who have been continuously support for the conducting uh, global webinars successfully. Thank you, thank you very much, sir. Last but not least, we thank each and every person who are directly or indirectly uh, support for the successful conduct of this webinar. Thank you, thank you, thank you one and all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saravanan. Thank you once again and thank uh, Dr. Emily Amundsen-Man for uh, readily accepting for the presentation and we had a nice uh, interactive uh, presentation. Thank you.